Hey, welcome to the Ghostman Radio Station, and I am talking today to Jay Ritchie, who is now going to introduce himself, because he knows more about himself than I do. So let's start with question number one. Um, how did you become a Christian? Well, I uh, wasn't born a Christian. I don't believe people are born uh, Christians. I think uh, scripture is clear that you have to choose to become a Christian. But I was raised in a religious home. We, we were Catholics. I, I, uh, I was raised by my aunt um, because my parents to raise me, unfortunately. Uh, my dad and my mom were struggling with homelessness and drug abuse and just weren't getting along in their relationship as well, so they really weren't a good place to raise me. Um, actually, my mom was not that old, uh, but she was pretty young. I think she was I think 27 when she had me, so... Um, my aunt, who raised me, I call her mom, uh, Barbara Ritchie, uh, she passed away last November, actually, last year, she died in the but she raised me, and I called her mom, she was the only mom I ever knew, and she raised me um, in a Catholic home, because that's all she knew. My grandfather was, was Catholic, and, uh, I'm sorry, my grandfather was Catholic, her dad was Catholic, and so that, you know, that's all that she knew, so she raised me in a Catholic home. We went to church every Sunday. And uh, yeah, I would ask questions about why we do this, why we have to do that. And, uh, I was uh, genuinely inquisitive from a young age. And I think that's you know, what God uh, put, put inside me is to always want to know why. And so uh, I would drive the priest crazy. I would ask questions. <laughs> and uh, they didn't like me too much asking a lot of questions, but I was, I was genuinely curious. And then in 1988, um, in the summer of 1988, two evangelists uh, came to my neighborhood, and they were inviting us to a Bible time rally. It was called, it was a vacation Bible school program called Neighborhood Bible Time. And you know, they were telling us that this rally, this five-day rally, Sunday, to, sorry, from Monday to Friday was uh, taking place at a Baptist church, uh, which wasn't far from where the, the Catholic church that we were attending at the time was probably like 12 or 13 blocks uh, you know, north of where I lived, and then the Baptist church was about that equal distance south of where I lived, so about 12 or 13 blocks south. And, um, you know, I wanted to go, and I was just telling my mom, I was like, look, please let me go, I'm bored, and all my friends are going, and, you know, and she said, well, uh, okay, I guess it's fine, so she, she let me go, um, and we heard, uh, you know, the gospel, um, at our level, um, every day, at the church, uh, rally, and, um, we played games, met other kids, met other kids, um, had ice cream, and it was from like 9 to 12 every, every day that week. And by Thursday, after hearing the gospel and, and you know, hearing the you know, stories from the Bible uh, every day that week, um, by Thursday, uh, when they gave the invitation, I was ready to, uh, to invite Christ into my heart as, uh, and to be my Savior, you know, to repent of my sin and, and put my trust in Christ. You know. I could understand from that young age what sin was. You know, I knew that I, I had disobeyed God. I, I wasn't you know, that bad of a kid, but I knew that I had broken at least some of his Ten Commandments. You know, one of the commandments is, Thou shalt honor thy mother and father. Well, I didn't always obey my, my mom. Um, and, you know, one of the other commandments 
consequences. You know, you shall not lie. Well, I, I told lies, uh, you know, at that young age as well, and I, you know, mistreated uh, some of my friends and stuff like that. So I knew that I had broken some of God's ten commandments, and I knew that, you know, that, that God was going to punish sin. He was going to actually punish me. And I didn't really understand, like, hell or, like, you know, I didn't really understand too much about God's judgment on sin, uh, as, you know, at that, at that young age. I knew the Bible uh, was taught to us, but, you know, at that rally, but I didn't really understand, like, hell or eternity without Christ. But I did know that if God was going to punish me, you know, worse than my, my mom would punish me if uh, I disobeyed her, then... I definitely knew that I needed to ask him for forgiveness. And it was through Jesus, his death and resurrection, that made it possible for someone like me to be forgiven. So I talked to one of the uh, youth workers. Um, I believe it was one of the pastor's daughters at the time. The, the, the pastor of that church uh, that hosted the neighborhood by the time rally, uh, one, of the, one of his daughters was one of the gospel workers that day, so uh, I talked to them, um, you know, they pulled me aside, um, you know, during the invitation time, and I was talking to them uh, in, uh, in the back, uh, you know, and I was just, they were just going over what it means to uh, become a Christian, what it means to be forgiven, what it means to get saved, so once I understood that, and I was ready, they
she didn't have a lot of money and she was always battling some type of sickness, but she was willing to make the sacrifice and, and, and adopt me and my sister Tracy and raise, raise us as, a, as her own. Um, because she didn't want us to become wards of the state, you know, for the government to take us and put us to the home of a strange family, so she was willing to take us in. But, uh, uh, so we, uh, we started growing in, in our faith and we growing, we growing to the Baptist church, study the Bible there, but I lost my dad, my biological dad, he died when I was nine, so just a year after I became a Christian, he died, he was murdered actually, and we never found the, the murderer, the case was never solved, but, um, and that didn't affect me that much, I was nine and I really didn't see him that much. Up to that point in my life, anyways, he was not really around. But when he died, you know, it was it affected my my mom, which was you know, his sister, biologically his sister in my arm. So um, that didn't really bother me. But when I lost my biological mother, she died of AIDS and, and pneumonia, and um, I thank the Lord that. I was born before she contracted AIDS because if I had been born after she contracted AIDS, I most likely would have had it myself. But uh, glory to God that I was born before she got AIDS. And, um, but she died that way, and she died when I was a teenager. She died when I was 13. I was just, you know, entering high school. And, and so when, when, she, when, when I got the new, that, that her death affected me. I didn't want to wake her up. Uh, I just snuck in the house, 
So, did this inspire you to get into the ministry then? Oh, no, no, it's, uh, it's, it's nothing major. Um, now, uh, I've got your little, I've got your book up, and it's called Evangelism's Flip Side, A Journey of Reaping the Unexpected. And uh, the first bit you have, you have, have you ever felt you lacked the desire or knowledge to effectively start a gospel-centered conversation with a non-Christian? Would you like to learn some new and creative methods to share the gospel with people. Would you like to see God's hand move mightily into your life in fle- in the flesh and unmistakably amazing ways? If you answer yes to today's questions, then this book is for you. From the first pages, this highly practiced book weaves in stories of real-life witnessing situations. We have inspirations from great, some great some giants of the Christian faith, such as Moody 
Sparrowgan, I probably would have said that now, Johnson, Jansen, and more. It also provides easy action steps and additional resources that help Christians to recognize and seize the soul winning opportunities right in front of them so they can enjoy one of the many benefits of evangelism that, uh, that much of Christendom has, has largely forgotten about today. Uh, and, and I like your quote from Daniel. 11.32 says the people that do that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. And it's just a little bit of the blurb that you've got from your book, which I would highly recommend, five stars, for anybody who wants to read it and um, find out about a journey of faith, because it is a long journey. It's not an instant journey. I found out the hard way what faith can do. I only found out my faith because I ended up in a coma and that sort of after that I became more spiritually aware of myself and my situation so I could sort of relate but not co- completely relate yeah so I, I um, was uh, you know, preaching and filling in for my pastor and also I was filling in for other churches of like faith preaching on their pulpits and helping them and with their ministries, and for, I did this about, about 10 years, and then in 2015, I um, found a ministry called Open Ear Campaigners, and uh, they present the gospel using uh, object lessons, using a paint board, uh, some, some of our uh, team members use skits and, and drama to present the gospel on, on the streets or in the subways or in churches and parks and so forth. And uh, really, we preach the gospel and we give the gospel out wherever people are. Because we believe missions is people. Missions is not just a foreign country. Uh, missions are people. So mission, people are everywhere. So missions really is, is everywhere. So uh, I, I, I met, I, met uh, I, I, I learned about their ministry and I met some of their people that uh, minister in the Boston area, which is where I'm from. Boston, Massachusetts, USA, and so I um, got in touch with with um, you know the leadership team of the Boston area branch, and I uh, just came to you know volunteer with with them and, and just kind of observe how they, their methods of like, sharing the gospel uh, out in the public, and um, it really is some of the similar ways that. The Apostle Paul in the book of Acts showed the gospel because the Bible te- teaches us that the Apostle Paul went to the marketplace, he went to you know theaters, uh, and, and shared the gospel with, uh, with people like that. And so that's kind of like the way that this ministry uh, does it. And, um, so I got in touch with them and I realized that this ministry was, was uh, a good fit for me. So took their training, they have a, like a one-week training, intensive training, where they train people how using their tools and methods to share the gospel publicly, and then um, uh, after taking their ministry um, candidate school, uh, I, they, they, they asked me to come on board, they were convinced that this was God's will, and that they wanted me to become uh, a missionary with them. And after uh, you know, praying about it for at least a couple of months, I decided that this was a good fit, and um, I became I I, part, I partnered group with them now to uh, take the gospel with them to you know, to this New England area where I'm at right now. And I've been with them and partnering with them and serving with them and using their tools since. Uh, 2016. Um, officially on board, I think since 2017. Um, so it's been a couple of years almost now. And, uh, uh, the book was some. It was really a comp- compilation of uh, a, a set point of time between uh, 2000. 12 and 2013. Uh, and it was really, you know, some, uh, it, 
evangelism escapades that God had brought me on, whether he had me preaching the gospel uh, in an airport or at a subway or in a park or to a waitress in a restaurant or a college campus or um, you know, in the country of Belize, you know, in Central America. These stories that God had given me, he, you know, he had been doing uh, you know, marvelous things. Um, I had some divine encounters with people, uh, especially in the country of Belize. So I just recorded that, these stories, and I typed them out on my, on my computer, and I just, you know, found some other helpful quotes um, from, you know, people like Charles Spurgeon or D.L. Moody, you know, giants of the Christian faith. And I included those quotes in the, um, the book that I typed up on my computer. But then I just left it there, and I just wasn't, I didn't, I hadn't, plan on having it published. I, I'm not a writer. I, you know, I don't think my, my English grammar is that great. In school, my best subject was math, not English. So I really had all these different excuses as to why I was not willing to publish the book. But just like Moses, you know, when Moses gave God all, of, all the excuses uh, that he was giving God, you know, when God asked, when God told him, I want you to be the one that we might people Israel out of Egypt, out of bondage, and most of say, I can't do that, how is Pharaoh going to listen to me, I'm not mm -hmm. a good eloquent speaker, and yada, 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 you know, and he, you know God gave God all these excuses, so I felt like Moses, I was giving God all these, all these excuses as to why I didn't put this book off my computer and get to book format, and uh, it's, it, you know, it's funny, if you want to make God laugh, just tell God what you can't do. Because God created you, so He knows more than you and I do about what we can do and what we can do. So He kept, you know, God kept knocking down all my excuses. He found me an editor, or several editors actually. He, um, he found me a publisher. Uh, actually, my sister's pastor, uh, who knew of, of, a, of a decent publisher, so got in touch with them, and they they said yes, we'd like to publish the book. And, um, and just, you know, one by one, the excuses went away, and um, I still was kind of hesitant, but then when I lost my mother to cancer in November 2018, uh, I realized that, you know, if I got this book published, I could dedicate it to her, because she, you know, she didn't have to raise me and my sister. She was a single, she was a single woman, uh, you know, making decent money, living her life um, on her own, but then she saw it, she saw a need, she saw that me and my sister, um, you know, needed a, a loving home, and so she put the sacrifice, she made the sacrifice, she adopted us, and, you know, she paid the price for our adoption, more ways than one, and she, you know, raised us, and so, she, because of her love and her sacrifice, you know, pouring into me and my sister and giving us a, a, a foundation to build on, uh, I wouldn't probably be the man that I am today. So I, I dedicated the book to, to my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, but then also to her. And now through, through the book getting out there, uh, her legacy, her act of love, her sacrifice can be remembered. Because uh, I dedicate, you know, she's, she's on the dedication page, so that's a memorial to her. And so that was kind of like the, the thing that uh, inspired me to, to really go ahead and get the book published. And so I did. And, and the book is not a how to book, it's, it's, um, it's because we have plenty of those. It's, it's really not telling people how to, you know, how to be the best evangelist, because I don't. I don't consider myself the best man this book. What the book is going to do is the book aims to encourage uh, Christians and inspire them to uh, step out of faith, to share the gospel with people, because it's through the gospel that people come to know uh, and have a relationship with God. You know, no, nobody is a Christian automatically um, anymore. You know, I'm, people, a lot of people think they go to church and, and they're Christian automatically, but don't become a Christian by going to church any more than I become a doctor by going to a hospital. It's, it's, it's only through a relationship with Jesus Christ that we can come to know God in a, in a personal way. And so, uh, 
Um, the book is to encourage Christians to share the faith, share the gospel with people, and it's really looking through my eyes and the, the, the escapades and the adventures that God has taken me on. And, and, and it reads like you know, it reads like a like a story, uh, you know, from one place, from one person to the next. You know, I talk to all different types of people in the book. I talk to Muslims. I talk to Catholics. Uh, I talk to people that have gone to church all their life but don't know uh, don't know the Lord Jesus uh, intimately or they you know I've, been, I've talked to disobedient Christians I've, I've in the book I've talked to all different types of people and in different places you know, people on the plane I've talked to in the airports I've talked to people that believe in evolution or atheists or whatever and it just won't it encourages people to see evangelism as not just a, it's, it's really not a monologue, it's a dialogue. Evangelism is a, it's a conversation, it is not a piece of paper. Jesus had conversations with Nicodemus in John chapter 3. He had conversation with the woman at the well in John chapter 4. And, and uh, even with the religious leaders, he had conversations. He would tell them the truth, and then he would let them ask questions, and, and it was back and forth, you know, and so the book uh, encourages people to look at evangelism like that. Also, it encourages and inspires Christians to see that evangelism is not just about bringing the gospel to a lost. I mean, that's only half the story. There's really more to evangelism than meets the eye. Uh, and, and, and my book will help, hopefully, to, to, to explain that uh, in they'll see it through these different stories and, and different adventures I'm on. But really, evangelism is like a two-sided coin. It's, you know, one side is what God is doing in the person that we're trying to you know, bring the gospel to, that we're trying to encourage the that they trust in Christ. But also evangelism has to do with what is God doing in the person that is sharing the gospel. What is he doing in this person sowing the seed, you know, and, uh, I think that evangelism is a great way for people to grow in their faith, because it, 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 it'll stretch their faith, and that's exactly what God wants us to do, he, I mean, it's like if you go to a gym, you're not going to build strong muscles unless your muscles are stretched, you know, lifting the weights, and God wants us to stretch our faith so that we can grow deeper in the knowledge of God, and, and through evangelism, stepping out in faith, and going to strange people, going to strange locations, God will uh, help grow the faith of his people, and that's that's the desire, because he doesn't want us to remain immature spiritual babies, he wants us to grow into mature spiritual adults, and I think evangelism is, is a great way behind, uh, obviously, reading our Bibles and praying, they, you know, engaging in evangelism is a great way to people to grow in their faith and to really see God move in, in fresh ways that uh, perhaps uh, God has not yet moved in their life. I see you've got the word, I'm going to say it slightly now, ap o jolix, which comes from the Greek word apollo joye, and is used eight times in the New Testament, Acts 22 to 1. 25 to 16, 1 Corinthians 9 to 3, 2 Corinthians 10, 5 to 6, Philippines 1 to 7, 2 Timothy 4 to 16, and Peter 3 to 15. But it's the last verse that is most commonly associated with Christian apologetics. But, but sacrifice Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to anyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is you in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. 1 Peter 3.15 Yeah, and it, it's really important that we don't think of evangelism as a one-time thing. It's a continuous thing. That means to you. Okay, then, well, uh, apologetics, yeah, the, in the Greek it's apologia, and uh, it, it basically just means to give a defense. Like if you were uh, 
were brought into court uh, in the days of uh, when, when Rome controlled uh, you know, Israel, back in the days of the Apostle Paul, uh, back in the days of Jesus even, when you were brought into court and they accused you of, of something, you would have to give your apologia, which means you, have, you would have to give your defense. And so uh, that verse you quoted in First Peter three fifteen, that in, that in, that is a command of Scripture to Christians to be ready. Uh, first of all, to s set Christ as Lord in our hearts. You know, we have to uh, we have to make sure that we are sharing the gospel, defending the faith, uh, setting Christ as Lord in our life. You know, he's the reason why we do what we do, and uh, then we're ready to give a defense for our faith. So when people ask us, you know, uh, why why are you a Christian? Well, we can give them uh, our defense, you know, as opposed to why we're Muslim, why we're an atheist, or whatever. I mean, uh, we, should, we need to be ready to, to, to know why we believe what we believe. Uh, and it's important, because, uh, you know, sharing the gospel is... Um, is, is when we proclaim the gospel, but it's also defending the gospel at the same time. And, uh, so that's what that means to me. Uh, of course, that doesn't mean you have to know all the answers uh, to every question. It just means that you know why you believe what you believe. You know that, that ultimately, if, if Jesus is God, and, and all, as the scripture says, all uh, knowledge and wisdom all the, tre all the treasures of knowledge and wisdom are in Christ, then we start our defense of our faith from Christ himself. That, you know, without him, we couldn't know anything. You know, and so that's how we uh, make our defense. But it doesn't mean we're arrogant, or it doesn't mean we come off as if we know it and, and everything. It just means that we know why we believe what we believe as Christians, so that we share this with people that have different worldviews, but we do it in respect. We do it knowing that we have a certain truth, because truth by definition is certain, uh, but we do it in gentleness and respect, uh, because we don't want to be a jerk about it, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I understand. I like the bit where you say about a trial faithful, because it says, Apostle Paul said, Ye who are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens of saints, of the household of God, Ephesians 2.19, is within the sanctuary of the church where we protect our faith, meeting together with others who believe, we pray, and find answers to our prayers, we worship through music, share testimony of the Saviour, serve one another, and feel the Spirit of the Lord. We partake the sacrament, receive the blessings of the priesthood, and attend the temple. The Lord declared, Adornances, the power of the godliness, is manifest. When you are faced with a test of faith, stay within the safety and security of the household of God. There is always a place for you here there. No trial is so large we can't overcome it together. I think in the world we're living at the moment, I think that's a very hard thing for trial faith, isn't it? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the entire statement. Um, you said it a little louder. Or... Yeah, I was saying, um, today, in today's world, the, the trial of faith is quite hard, isn't it? Of all the situations that are going on in the world. Oh, absolutely, I would agree. I mean, even as an example, like, uh, right now, I'm learning Spanish. Uh, it's, it's really a joke because my English isn't, the greatest, and now I'm learning another language, so that's uh, pretty funny. But no, I have a desire to learn Spanish, um, and right now I I take uh, classes with uh, with Spanish tutors that are from Venezuela. Uh, most of them are from Venezuela. Some of them are in uh, Colombia, but we take classes, uh, you know, through Zoom, uh, and. Um, most of my tutors are Christians, so they know firsthand what it means to struggle uh, in, to, in, to have uh, difficulties, you know, uh, because right now their country is you know, 
little worse for the wear. Um, it's unstable, and uh, they don't have they don't have some of the supplies or some of the resources that we have in the West. Um, you can't get certain vitamins. You can't get certain foods and certain medicines in the country, and uh, so it's difficult. And, and these people that are sick and need help and, and, and stuff like that. And so, uh, you know. I, I, I hear from them. I, I you know I I hear their their struggles and, and of course there's people in there's people in uh, Iran. There's people in North Korea that are struggling that, that are Christians. I mean even if you're not Christians, the the world's difficult. But but of course we as Christians we know that when Jesus told us that you know in this world you will have tribulation. But we need to be of good cheer because he has overcome the world. So there's no, ultimately, there's no reason for Christians to be depressed. That doesn't mean we don't get depressed, but there is no reason legitimately to be depressed because Jesus has overcome the world. That, you know, God is on our side. Even though this world is fallen, this world is sinful, and this world is chaotic, it's got natural disasters, it's got crime, and poverty and all that stuff. Um, God has a plan. We know that God is in control. He's sovereign. Um, he's good. And so therefore, there's going to be a good end to these things. There's a good purpose to these things. Um, even this, even the, the death of his son was, you know, was terrible. But uh, he, he had a plan through it, you know, to redeem the world. And so God can take something bad and turn it into good. Um, and we know that throughout Scripture, he's shown us example after example after example of, of uh, people that have had uh, you know, uh, difficult trials and struggles to go through, but he would turn it around for good. Um, and so, and I've seen that in my own life, that you know, I've uh, struggled with things, and even uh, you know, I've struggled with poverty, I've struggled with disease, I've struggled with people betraying me and uh, just, you know, financial worries and all that stuff. Uh, you know, every trial that anybody goes through is not unique. Ultimately, we all go through the same things, just at different times. And then, uh, but, you know, there is um, there's hope in the Lord. Uh, we can overcome. The Bible tells us, in, for example, in Romans chapter 8, verse uh, 38, um, that all things work together for good to them that love God, who are the called according to his purpose. So there is a purpose in our pain. And sometimes we can't see it because we're so focused on the pain, but if we would shift our focus and our perspective to to the goodness of God, to the sovereignty of God, then we can realize that nothing will happen without his permission, and nothing will happen without his purpose, without his plan. And so there's no accidents you know, uh, tra any tragedy that happens to us is no accident. Um, just like to take the life of Job. You know, Job suffered, and, and uh, you know, he didn't bring that suffering on himself necessarily, but he was a, it was a, he was allowed to suffer through it. But you know, he did learn some things about himself. He learned some things about God that, that he didn't know before, and that at the end, you know, God showed His faithfulness and. and, and um, had uh, revealed the purpose behind Job's suffering, and, and, and he also revealed a blessing to Job at the end of the suffering as well. So there is, you know, so I would just encourage people who are struggling with any, whatever, whatever they're struggling with, whether it's something small or something big, God takes notice, you know, and as a loving Heavenly Father, He's going to provide for His people, um, and we just have to you know, instead of asking the question, why did something bad happen? Why did this happen to me? That's the wrong question. We should be asking, what can I do to glorify the Lord through this? How can I turn this around so that God gets glory for this? And how can I use this situation to help someone off, to help someone worse off than I am? That's really the focus that we should have. It will help us to, uh, you know, to navigate.
navigate this suffering. Because no suffering is not eternal. If we have Christ as our Savior, then Christ already took the greatest amount of suffering, which is, you know, the eternal separation from, from, from God in hell. He already took that punishment for us. So, so all these other temporary, all these other earthly you know, trials and, and sufferings, these are just temporary. They're not eternal. They will, they will end. And so we can rest assured that these are only temporary uh, circumstances. But, you know, eternal life and salvation and a new home in heaven uh, is eternal. So that's, the, that's really the, the perspective that we need to have. Um, what, what um, do you think? I'm, I'm, um, I'll tell you how I got into Christ. Uh, um, my faith got enhanced because, as I mentioned before, I had a near death experience. Um, I had a blood pressure of one two four. I was taken to hospital and then put in induced coma for three weeks. And whilst I was in that coma, I heard a woman's voice I've not heard before or since telling me to wake up and I had the most overwhelming feeling I ever had to wake up and that from that day that it sparked my interest more in spiritually and made me more aware of myself and my spiritual being I also believe that I sort of touched a, a heaven but not quite because I wasn't obviously dead dead but I think I sort of touched it, and you get when you talk to most people who've had these experiences, more or less people say the same. Yeah, yeah and you know, God can use that, uh, you know, obviously, uh, as you're sharing, that He's used this type of situation in your life to get your attention, because, uh, you know, if God has to use a trial or a sickness to get our attention in this life, do it because uh, you know because ultimately what God desires is for people to come to repentance and to trust Him, trust His Son Jesus as Savior. And so sometimes God will use a sickness or will use a you know, you know uh, he might use a radio program like this. He might use a gospel track that someone finds on the, on the ground. They might use a uh, TV program. Uh, he might use uh, friend or a loved one to speak into our lives, to speak truth in our lives, and if we're lost, if we're without Christ, you know, God wants us to come to repentance, so he will use the, the, the circumstance to, to bring us to the realization of our real need, our true need, you know, our true need isn't to be, you know, without any trials, isn't to be without any sickness, you know, but our true need is, is, is uh, spiritual. And it's, you know, it's, it's um, you know, to come to know that we have broken his laws morally, you know, we, we have a conscience, we know that what's right and wrong, you know, we know lying, stealing, and cheating, and murder, and stuff like that is wrong. It was against his commandments. And when we take a look at the law of God, we realize that all of us fall short of, of, of his standard of righteousness. And even, even the Bible tells us that in Romans chapter 3, verse 23. It says, but all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So when we look at God's moral law, we realize that we do fall short. And the law was given to us as a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. So in other words, the law, God gave us the moral law um, to show us that you know, the law was, wasn't meant to, to save us. So people that think they're going to obey God's law in order to get to heaven, they cannot do it. It was not meant to save us. The law is only meant to condemn that's why we need a Savior. So Jesus was sent into the world and had a rescue mission. We are saved because the law condemns us, but Jesus offers salvation. You know, you and I and the rest of the, the, the people in the world, you know, that have lived or ever will live, are sinners. We've broken God's law, but Jesus paid the fine. So when we repent, as Jesus said in that mark, he told, he told us to repent and believe the gospel. The gospel of what he's done for us on the cross in the resurrection. So the, you know, he tells us to repent he means to turn around, you know, to, to turn from going the wrong way, to turn from going our way, you know, and being our own authority and being our own God. We have to repent from that, turn from that, and then turn to Christ, not just believe in Jesus, but 
trust him with our soul, trust him with our life, and to commit to follow him, you know, for, for the rest of our life until he takes us home uh, with him or he comes back uh, to this earth. So that's that's the point uh, of, of, of suffering is to really show us that we need to repent, we need to put our trust in Christ. And when we do that, you know, the moment we put our trust in Christ, the moment we truly repent and we're truly sorry for our sin and come to Christ, we put, our, we put the salvation of our soul in His hand. Uh, God will give us the new birth. The Bible says, except, except the man be born again, it cannot be you know, heaven. If we're born again uh, by faith in Christ, we will. Uh, forgive our sins, cleanse our sinful record you know, completely, you know, make us uh, a new person. We will no longer see us as sinners, we will see us as righteous as Jesus is, because it was the blood of Christ that cleansed us from our sin totally. And God will give us a new birth, and that will, uh, will adopt us into his family as his children. It's kind of like what my aunt did for me. She adopted me, my sister, to her home into her family and to raise us in the spirit she speaks and Jesus did the same to me through the gospel he adopts people into God's family and so we can live with him we can live with him forever and then you know, live for him all the days of the rest of our life so um, that's the that's the that's the reason why I wrote the book is to just to encourage people uh, to to live out the gospel because time is short, this life is you know, not uh, long at all. You know, my, my grandfather died in '96. He died suddenly. He was healthy one day, and then he dies in his sleep the next day, and he's passed into eternity. So, you know, that's why the, the, the real, the most important thing for people to do is to think about their relationship with God or lack thereof. You know, pick up, I would encourage people to just pick up the Bible and start reading in the Gospel of John. It's a great place to start. And that's how God speaks to people. He speaks to people through His Word, primarily. He can also speak to you through the Holy Spirit, but primarily through His Word. And, um, and I think that you know, if more people uh, would, would read the Bible and believe what it says, I think they, would, they would be better off, and this world would be better off. So that makes to be seen if that's going to happen or not. But that's why uh, he told us to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Do you um, do any your own podcast, or are you, is it just a book that you have out at the moment? Yes, just a book for the moment. Um, I'm still new to podcasting. Uh, I haven't decided if it's something I want to get into. Uh, I am still. Uh, I still work. You know, a secular job right now, and uh, but I also do the ministry, so um, it remains to be seen what God is going to do, what doors He'll open, what doors He's going to close. Uh, so I'll, I'll stay open to the possibility. Uh, well, it, if you do do it and you want, are interested, you can always share it on my show. I don't mind. I don't, I don't mind offering anybody. To, to, if you can't find someone to put it on in it, because sometimes things cost a cost a little bit more than you think they do. I'm, I'll put it on mine. I don't mind. It doesn't cost me nothing. All you know, you've got to do is send me an MP3 file, and I'll put it on. Okay, that sounds good. Yeah. Can, uh, well, I think it's important to talk about faith. I mean, I know pe- I'm not. I admit mean, like you, I'm, I don't want it, we're not ramming it down people's throats, it's just a question of, that it's out there, you should read it, and if you want to gain something from it, do. No one's twisting your arm, no one's saying, you know, <laughs> at the end of the day, people are people, you know, you can't change their minds. Them, uh, 
Well, I wish you great success with your book, my friend. And um, obviously, as always, time goes like no tomorrow. And it, as it's coming up to the end of the show, um, now, I n- normally ask my guests to do like a, a unique sign-off. So what would your unique sign-off be? And mine would be, let God enter your soul, give him a chance. If you listen, you may be surprised how much he can, you can benefit from it. Because faith is a powerful thing, my friend. Along with prayer, it can do, it can move mountains, it can heal people who never, who never been healed before. And that's my end of the show. I'd like to thank you for being on the show, and good night.